For those of you that don't know me, I'm Chris Reisig. I'm the U.S.-based operating partner at Jungle Ventures. I'm based here in beautiful Boston, Massachusetts, uh, where it's morning. And so good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the latest version of the Jungle Ventures Founders Assembly. We are bringing insights and information from tech luminaries around our network, around the world, to our network of founders and operating executives in this exclusive invite-only series of webcasts. And today, we're really excited to have with us a true luminary in the tech industry, Brian Halligan. And, and we were fortunate, Anurag and I, to have worked with Brian in Asia back in the late 90s. And so he's not only a luminary, but a friend. For those of you that don't know Brian's history, of course, like all great tech executives, he got his start at Parametric Technology, PTC, where he and I and Anurag worked. Um, but he's gone on to do some amazing things since then. Most of you will know him as the co-founder and CEO of HubSpot. Um, he's truly lived the startup dream. Not only did he build a great company, but he transformed an entire industry. And really, I think something that's unique created a category uh, in the area of inbound marketing in the process. And that's something that I think uh, is not for the faint of heart, which hopefully Brian will share some of those stories. Creating a category is a, is a, a big deal. Um, he started HubSpot in 2006. I think it was a class project at MIT Sloan with his co-founder, Darmesh. Uh, and since has grown the company to almost 700 million in revenues with a valuation of over $10 billion. So uh, kudos to Brian. Prior to starting HubSpot, he was a venture partner at Longworth Partners and a VP of sales at Groove Networks, which was acquired by Microsoft. Uh, Brian's been named top rated CEO by Glassdoor every year from 2014 to 2018. Also listed by Comparably as one of the top five best CEOs at a large company in 2018 as well as one of the top five best CEOs for women and for diversity in 2018. He was also named to the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year category in 2011 and the Inc. Founders 40 in 2016. So we're honored to have Brian here. Brian, thank you for sharing some time with us today. We really appreciate it. No, it's an honor. I, I love you too. Great, great memories from the years we worked together and uh, really, really appreciate the invite. Absolutely. So Aaron, why don't I kick it over to you and you can start off with uh, the initial set of questions. Yeah, great to have you, Brian. Thank you so much. I I remember you almost fired me because I put you in a black and yellow <laughs> taxi from Mumbai or from Pune to Mumbai or Mumbai to Pune. And you know, I'm glad you didn't fire me, but <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> you, you know, I, I it was interesting. I was just looking at the history of the firm. I realized you went IPO on 9th of October. Is that true? I don't remember. It's 8th of October, so it must be, it's even. <laughs> okay, I didn't remember that. Oh, we got a nice anniversary coming up. Yeah, I was just looking at the history and I'm like, what a coincidence. What was it like? I mean, the evening of 8th, you're going IPO the next day. I saw a picture of you leading your team in Wall Street. I'll tell you about the morning of the IPO was interesting. They picked us up in a black car, or they had a black car pick my co-founder and I, Darmesh and I, up at our hotel. And there's a lot of security around the New York Stock Exchange, so they dropped us around the uh, the corner. And I was pretty calm, cool, relaxed. I mean, the, the IPO road shows a lot, but I was just ready to kind of get on with it, not overthinking it. And then I rounded the corner, I looked up at the New York Stock Exchange and I didn't know they did this, but they wrapped the whole New York Stock Exchange in your company's logo. And I just started, I choked up, was really welled up, started crying, kind of turned so Dermesh couldn't see me. He turned the other way, <laughs> I think he was doing the same thing. <laughs> And I sort of choked my way through the day. I was really choked up through the day. Like I had to give a speed. They do a breakfast at the New York Stock Exchange with the CEO of the Stock Exchange. And it's a lot of pomp and circumstance and kind of choked my through wet that through the bell and that whole thing. And one of the more interesting moments in the day was, so you go public, uh, you, ring, you ring the bell. It take, took about 45 minutes for the initial price to get actually settled in. And then it got settled in and you all like I do probably have a stocks app on your phone. And I remember our market cap was a billion dollars and Darmesh came over and showed me this billion dollars. Oh my God, take a screenshot. We may <laughs> never see that again. <laughs> uh, well, he but was, it was right. <laughs> that's true. Uh, it was a terrific day and it was, you know, there's very few times I find as a founder, you're always fighting a fire. There's always a problem. You're always working on some issue where you can really step back and look back and take stock of what you've done. I almost never do that. That was one of those days that 
you know, I, I left myself some room and some time to do that and, and left all the problems aside. So that, it was a wonderful day. Um, it was just a, a magical day and we have worked so hard. I mean, all of you, you're, you're on founding teams or whatnot. You work hard, you buck conventional wisdom and it's, it's validating. It's validating. Having said that, I see a lot of companies that go public and they kind of rest in like, oh, that was it. That's the finish line. We, our mantra was the IPO is the starting line, not the finish line. And we always had that mindset and we kind of beat that into our employees' heads. And that's, not, that's been our mindset that we were just, that we're just getting started on that. And that, that's, that's helped us, I think. And Brian, I mean, I'm sure when you started the firm, I mean, did you see this getting that big? I know Chris just said 10, I think it's at 14 billion. I, I think your stock's running pandemic times. I think your stock's gone from 100 to 300. Revenues are up uh, 25% year over year while, while there's, there's virus around here. But you know, then and over the last few months, this whole run, was that something all planned? I mean, when did you start seeing this happening? I would say when we started the company, <clears throat> we hoped this would happen, but we weren't super confident it would happen. <laughs> and I think it's a, 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 an equal measure of luck and skill that it happened. We picked a good market. The timing was good. I picked a good co-founder. Our early team was good. We had good investors. We pivoted a couple times along the way. We've made some good decisions, but we've had a fair amount of good fortune and luck. And I think it's an equal measure of both that got us to where it is. I, one of the things I think is excited about HubSpot is take the stock price away. The stock prices are really weird things because there's so much a function of stuff out of your control. Like the multiples on the stock market are very high today. For a SaaS company, they could go down <clears throat> for good or bad reason. But overall, my, my sense of the business is this is going exceptionally well. And like, I'd see an extremely bright future for the business over the next 10, 10 plus years. And Brian, I remember meeting you whenever I was there at Boston, maybe two years ago, 18 months ago. And, and you said, you know, you've been going at this for 12, 13 years at that time. And, and you said, you see yourselves going at it for the next 12 or 13 years. And in Jungle, we talk a lot about build to last. I mean, how do you want to share your vision? Because you're really, and I mean, you're looking at Salesforce. You know, you were asking me, what's that fresh test company out of India? And then you're looking at Salesforce and saying, I got to take these guys down. I mean, this whole concept of building long lasting companies, any experiences, thoughts there to share? One of the reasons that there's just not a lot of time to sit back and reflect and take stock on how well things have gone is I just think the software tech industry, software industry is moving awfully fast and you can't relax. So you get run over. So above us, we compete with salesforce.com, Adobe, Microsoft, you know, huge companies up there. And then below us is little companies like Zoho and Freshdesk and there's always some new startup that's got a bullseye on our back. So I never really feel the luxury of being able to just sit back and say, we got it figured out. We're constantly on the move and constantly trying to iterate. A lot of people think our mission is to disrupt salesforce.com. Like people use the analogy of uh, salesforce.com is to Oracle, as HubSpot is to Salesforce. That's actually not our mission and what motivates us or our employees. It's like companies' missions is to enable millions of companies to grow better. Uh, grow more efficiently, grow faster, but grow in a non kind of douchey way. I want to build a company my grandkid will be proud of that. My grandkid will say, oh yeah, my dad works at or worked at or founded HubSpot and like glows with pride because HubSpot's such a great company, contributed so much to its customers and its partners and its investors and more and more to our community. And so those missions are, are, are good. I mean, they're motivating to me. Uh, they're motivating to my partner. And you know, we've had interest in selling the company and whatnot. It's like, I can't imagine doing something that's more interesting or motivating than that. So we just try to keep it grounded in mission. We're very mission oriented. We're a mission driven company and mission driven culture. So Brian, you know, you're clearly in the scale stage now or beyond the scale stage, but as you know, in the earlier stages of a company, do you remember at what point you sort of shifted from being a startup to being ready to scale and what changed the, what operationally changed, what, what changed about your role and the way that you tried to sort of lead the company when you went through that shift? Yeah, that's a really great question. The thing about HubSpot is people always ask me, you know, what was that moment or what was the magic bullet or the one decision or the one hire or the one thing? 
there really wasn't. And I still see it today as HubSpot's like two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back, and constantly just trying to get better, constantly iterating in that continues today. We're like a big startup today. So there wasn't that one moment or that one change or that one shift or that one decision. It's been very gradual and it does very much feel like two steps forward, one step back. Like there's always a problem. Maybe it's a competitor infusing a problem. Much more often than not though, it's a self-induced problem. Like we made an unforced error. We made a poor decision or a poor hire or whatever it might be. There's an infinite number of things you can do wrong. And as we've gone on, Chris, uh, everything sort of breaks like the whole as you're going up from 10 people to 100 people to a thousand people to whatever we're at now 4,000 people as soon as you think you got it figured out it breaks like nothing nothing actually scales uh, forever yeah uh, you got to retool yeah. everything including the teams and the people and the IT systems and the processes and the way we market and the way we sell and the way we build product like every couple of years it's like all right we got to rethink that. I think that served us well. We haven't been too wedded to the past, too wedded to, to anything really. <laughs> uh, the yeah. team is interesting at HubSpot. Like when I look back at HubSpot when we had four people, okay, it was just my co-founder and I and a couple other folks, but 40 people, our team was largely a group of, uh, the, the management team was a group of folks we went to, uh, to MIT with people building products and person running marketing, person running sales, person running engineering, person running uh, everything. We're friends of ours, friends from our network from school. And they all did really well. And quite honestly, I thought, well, those will, that'll be the team we'll have forever. That's a, the team was awesome. Super proud of that team. And then when I look back at like 400 employees, you know, I have, most of them were gone. Um, you know, they either left because they liked that early stage startup or you know, they didn't scale in their own way. And by the way, most of them, when they went on, they did awesome stuff. One's a professor at Harvard Business School. A bunch of them started companies, joined startups. Like, it's a really awesome group. And then from 400, there's a new crew from 400. Most of that crew's gone. And <laughs> kind of a new crew today at 4,000. Like, we recently hired this woman, uh, Yamini Rangan, who's terrific, uh, who's running all our go-to-market stuff. And... Yeah, you know, she just comes in with a different attitude and a different mindset. So uh, it's been interesting. It's constantly evolving and we've never really sat still. Staying on the topic of kind of scale, uh, as you may know, we have a, a few companies in our portfolio that are starting to consider going public and when the right time to do that might be. When did you know that you guys were ready? Like what were the key signs or harbingers of readiness to be a public company? We probably weren't. Uh, <laughs> we had some investors that had been in a while and they were looking for an exit and we also wanted to go public. Like it was on our life list. We wanted to do it. So they pushed us and we were like, all right, let's do it. But when I look back, we were probably early. Uh, one of the things that was going on at HubSpot at the time of our IPO is we had started as a marketing application company. We came up with this idea of inbound marketing, a new way to market. And we built a suite, really an application to help marketers market in a new way and grow faster. And we were transitioning from that to more of a CRM vendor or a front office suite vendor to help people with their whole go to market. And we were very early nascent in that journey. And so the, the PowerPoint deck that we used to convince investors was a funny one because we have this core business growing and steady our unit economics work. And in the end we say, oh, you, by the way, we have this startup inside of HubSpot and we're going into CRM or we're going into sales and we want to transform that industry. And it was like a little kind of stub of revenue growing quickly. And it was an awkward story to tell. And I think the story would have been infinitely better had we waited a year or even two years to go public. But we kind of wanted to go public. I don't know. We, Darmesh and I wanted to do it. And we had an investor that was pushing us really hard to do it. And he was convincing. So we just went for it. But I would, I would be patient. By the way, it used to be that you could get higher valuations uh, for the same business on a public round than you could on a private round. And they're basically the same thing. And the public round now, or at least historically, for the last few years, it's flipped the other way. Whereas if you waited and you went and you did a series D or an E or an F or whatever letter of the alphabet you want to do at that point, you're at that point, you could get a much higher valuation in the private market than the public market. 
I don't know if that's true. Today, the public market's been really hot, so it's a weird time in the private markets. I'm sure it'll shake out in the next couple of months. But for the last couple of years, the private market, market valuations have been high. There's been plenty of cash out there. It used to be in the late stage venture world, it was hard to raise late stage venture. And there were only a couple of venture funds that kind of specialized in it. A couple of things have changed around late stage venture in the United States, at least. Uh, one, the early stage folks, the Sequoias, the Andreessen Horowitz, the Excels, they have these barbell funds where they like to do early and they like to do late. So they'll do a big $100 million late stage uh, fund. Another change is the public investors, like the Fidelities and the Wellingtons and the T. Rowe Prices, they'll come down and do a private round, big money round. Uh, and so there's plenty of cash out there and the valuations are high. So I would preach patience on the IPO. And of course, you have the private equity angle as well now that didn't exist years ago. That's Definitely did in. not. The other thing that changed and, and, and started changing, we did, our, we did our Series D with Sequoia. And I remember part of their pitch was, we're going to put new money in, but we want to buy some of your shares. In retrospect, that we sold, we sold them some of our own sh personal shares. In retrospect, terrible decision because I mean, those shares are worth 100 times more today than they were back then. But their strategy was actually kind of smart. They, they were afraid they were going to invest in HubSpot. And then six months later, Salesforce or Oracle or somebody's going to come and acquire us. And they wanted us to kind of have a backbone to say, no, we were financially very secure here and we're going for the very, very long haul. So that's another thing that's changed about, about the, the economics of uh, going public is if you want to cash out or you want your senior team to cash out or even all your employees to cash out in a late stage large round, you can bring in new capital, but you can also take some money off the table. And I even, I kind of joked that it was a terrible investment decision of mine. I, I, I think it was a good decision for HubSpot and for me personally at the time. Because it gave you the freedom to look longer term, right? Yeah. You know, the three of us, we, we worked at a startup called PTC and all of us joined early and it was a real rocket ship. And we, we all made some decent money. It was a good run. But it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to sit on the beach and maybe on a rock, but I'm going to sit on the beach and retire kind of money. Um, basically, their calculus was, let's, let's make sure inside Brian and Darmesh's head that it's just not that interesting if someone comes along and tries to acquire your company, that you've got a big enough bank account that you're really not worried about money ever again. Um, and I think karmically and psychologically, that, that play works. And I, I'd encourage founders to you know, take Anurag up or whoever your next round uh, lead is and do that kind of thing. No, I, I think that's, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think, Brian, that, that's starting to a little bit change. I mean, there's still here where if the founder said, I need a little bit of money and, and they still own 45% of the company at times you have investors will say, no, 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 no. I mean, and, and, and it's, it's great that you share that perspective. I remember walking around your office and you of course had your beautiful puppy, but then I think one of your members took me around and I could feel it. And, and, you know, your culture is really talked about. It's, it's inspirational. It's, you know, it's lasted over the time. I mean, I guess part of, what we would like to know from you is when do you really start thinking culture? I mean, did you start thinking from very early so that something came in later? And then yeah. over the years, have you seen a change? Is that something that you've hired your leadership for or not hired? How's that whole experience been? That's an excellent, excellent question. Uh, I remember the first two years of HubSpot, the word culture was a, was a dirty word for Dharmesh and I. Anyone talk about culture, would just roll our eyes like, ah, it's a bunch of crap. Who cares about that stuff? That's the numbers. Yeah, what's going on? We're shipping product. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> and about two years into HubSpot, uh, and I recommend this to any founder out there, CEO, is I joined a CEO group and there were nine CEOs that met once a quarter for a day and went very deep on a topic. And it was a little bit of like, you learn from each other, but it was also misery loves company. It was a little bit like seeing your CEO psychiatrist. Uh, and I largely joined it because there was a CEO on there named Colin Engel that uh, ran a company called iRobot. And you'll know iRobot because they make the Roomba, those robot vacuum cleaners. And I, I was totally had a man crush on Colin Engel. I just thought he was brilliant and he was ahead of us and he was public and I just wanted to learn, learn, learn the fruit. So I largely joined because of him. And the format of the meeting on was, was they had a topic and they tell you the topic when you showed up at the meeting. And the day I showed up at the first meeting, 
I sat right down next to Colin because I got a man crush net on him. And he announces that the topic for the meeting is culture. I said, Fuck. <laughs> what a waste of time here. What a stupid culture. And I remember I didn't participate. I sort of, you know, I, I wear my heart on my sleeve. We were grabbing coffee around 1030 at the break. And he said, uh, you know, Brian, I don't think you think this culture thing is important. I said, you're right. I, I think it's a bunch of horse shit. And he said, you know, Brian, culture is how you build a big company. Culture. Culture is how people make decisions when you're not in the room. Okay. So go through the meeting and starting getting engaged, you know, whatever. And I go back to the office and Darmesh said to me, how'd the CEO meeting go? I said, it was really good. We talked about culture. And Darmesh said, culture? Ah. What a waste of time. I said, no, Darmesh, I don't know if you knew this. Culture is how you scale your company. Culture is how you make decisions when you're not in the room. And I basically parroted Colin's whole thing. And it was, it was that meeting and that moment uh, that changed it. And so Darmesh, ironically, who is really introverted, like the big introvert, we volunteered him to be the culture guy. And so his first step was he surveyed all the employees. Maybe there were 50 at the time. And he, it was a net promoter survey, scale of one to 10, how likely you're to refer HubSpot to a friend and then why. And almost everyone said they liked the culture and uh, they were glad we were talking about this stuff. And he, he took the answers to that and he built, actually with one of our professors from business school, like a first cut of a culture deck. And we call that our culture code. And what the culture code does, the deck did, was it defined the relationship between the employee and the company. And we think of HubSpot as having two products. We have a product we sell to our customers. That product has to be unique relative to the competition and has to deliver massive value to our customers. Our culture code, our culture is our second product. And we need to build a, a, a culture that is unique relative to our competition and is really compelling to our employees and prospective employees. So we started taking it very, very seriously back then. We built that culture code. Every six months or so, we do a, a tweak of it. Actually, Darmesh right now is doing the, the first complete overhaul of the culture code deck, given all the stuff that's happened in the world, we need to rethink some of it. So that's kind of how we've thought about it over the years. And I'll give you one more thought on that, because. I remember being at that, the phase a lot of your companies are. We didn't know what to do about hiring an HR person. Our investors were like, you need to hire an HR person. And we just couldn't meet anyone that we thought was great in HR. And maybe it's changed in the industry, but it was just like, they weren't hardcore, they weren't analytical, they weren't innovative, they weren't thinking like, how do we build an awesome place to work? They were all thinking about benefits and you know, sort of very traditional stuff. We wanted to kind of transform that employee experience, match the way employees work with the way they, they think and the way they live and the way times are changing. And so we ended up giving HR to a woman on our marketing team, and she's still with HubSpot, named Katie Burke. And she has zero, zero background in HR, was a really good marketer, which is important because you're marketing to prospective employees, you're marketing to your existing employees. And we said, you're going to take on people ops and you're going to figure all this. You're going to take this culture code and turn it into something special and build the machine. That worked out really exceptionally well for us over time. Um, I don't know if that will work for you, but we just, we had a hard time on the HR side, finding someone that grew up in HR that was kind of hardcore like us. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I think that there's a lot of companies putting an entrepreneur um, in that role I've seen in some of the companies. If somebody built a company, got to a size, sold it. And mm -hmm. then coming back and like go and lead that function, not forever, but we've seen a lot of success. But on that sort of topic of, you know, culture, one thought that came in my mind, which I want to ask, how has it been balancing from sort of creating leaders from inside the company versus, you know, hiring people from outside? And there's a lot more talent in the U.S. I mean, the t talent here is developing. Uh, so we don't have the luxury of a whole lot of talent from outside. But has there been any experience there of internal talent versus outside? I have the same drumbeat I beat. So the center of gravity in the United States is San Francisco and Silicon Valley. We're up in the same town as Chris Reisig in Cambridge, Massachusetts. 
And there's just not a lot of big tech companies in, in Massachusetts anymore. Uh, Akamai is there, Wayfair, but there's a thousand awesome companies in San Francisco. So we have kind of the same thing. There's not a lot of people in and around Boston that have really scaled those companies up. The way I've always thought about management teams and whatnot is we've all, I've always thought of it's a little bit like, this is probably a bad analogy, but in, in, Amer in American baseball, uh, the best teams, if you look at the best constructed teams, they're a nice combination of players that the team drafted out of high school, let's say, grew up through their minor league system, came to the major leagues and developed into a great player. Combined with some veterans, they, they get through what's called free agency in the United States on their team. And so it's usually this blend of veterans that have been there, done that. And these folks who really grew up for the culture and really get it. And, and we've always kind of thought of it that way. Actually, we haven't always thought about that. In the early, we thought we were just homegrown. But we've, now we've got kind of a nice mix of the two inside of HubSpot. So like, for example, uh, we just hired this woman, Yamini. She runs Go to Market. She's terrific. Uh, but Katie Burke, who runs HR, oh, she grew up through our system, homegrown. Um, our head of product and our head of engineering, homegrown, kind of grew up through our system. Our CFO, we hired from Akamai down the street, sort of a free agent, really good. And so it's sort of this mix of outside veteran talent with homegrown talent. I think that's healthy. I don't know if that's the right mix it's for everyone, but that's worked really well for us. So Brian, um, shifting gears just a little bit. So we talked earlier in the call about the fact that you built a new category. And as you know, for some entrepreneurs and founders, they're entering a market where there's already a set of competitors and they're doing something better, different, more unique. You chose a more daunting path in some ways to create a brand new category. And we do have a bunch of companies in our portfolio that are considering that path. Can you talk about the difference in those two paths for a sec? This was one of our most debated topics in the first couple of years of HubSpot is should we I mean, HubSpot's first product line is marketing app. You could easily describe it as an internet marketing application. It was marketing automation plus search engine optimization plus your website plus your blog uh, plus social media, those email landing pages. It was it was marketing automation plus. Um, and we we had a big argument in the early days. Should we call it internet marketing software or should we create this new category that we'll call inbound marketing? And it was not an obvious decision. And we went back and forth on it several times. The benefit of just calling it in internet marketing software was people were searching on that term. People understood what the heck you were talking about when you said internet marketing software. And it wasn't a huge lift. Like, yes, you entered this market. You're a little differentiated. You try to do it better than everyone else. Your marketing costs and your energy in creating a category are very low. We decided to do the inbound marketing thing and it worked out. I don't know what would have happened had we done internet marketing software, by the way. I would just say it's not for the faint of heart. The things that worked about inbound marketing was that term, inbound marketing, you know, pulling people into your website, matching the way you market and sell with the way people buy versus outbound marketing, spam, cold call, ads, stuff like that. There was a yin and a yang and a good cop and a bad cop. And as we've seen over time on the internet, the internet loves good cop, bad cop, likes conflict, likes that kind of thing. The name in that inbound versus outbound was as much, that, that had a big part of it. The name really worked. Uh, the story really worked. Like you need to transform the way you market to match the way people are actually shopping and buying and learning. And this is the time when YouTube was rising, podcasts were rising, blogging was rising. So that your cost to create content and pull people in was dropping like, it all kind of put in there nicely. The reason I say it's not for the faint of heart is over half our marketing energy for the first 10 years of HubSpot didn't go into HubSpot, went into inbound marketing. We do a giant conference. We lose money on the conference, by the way. Uh, we have an inbound marketing blog that we spend a ton of energy on. Like we wrote a book about inbound marketing. It was a huge, huge lift on our part. And it, I guess it paid off, but I don't know what would have happened on the other side. Now, I'll tell you why it's also a cautionary tale. After we did that, we moved into the sales software, CRM software. We said, all right, we know this play. Inbound sales versus outbound sales. Let's do the playbook again. We'll create some content. Da, 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 da. We got the conferences. Like, let's just ladder this up. Didn't work. 
no, no one bought it. We push it so hard. I was on stages writing articles and podcasts. Like it's, you don't get it. It's inbound sales versus outbound sales. And everyone's like, no, nope, don't buy it. Don't buy it. And so we kind of caught lighting in the bottle with the inbound marketing. And I've tried to do that in other things. Like we came out with a website management product. A lot of people call it a content management system. It was a really good content management system. I tried to create a new category called a content optimization system no one would have it. It just didn't stick. So now we call our website product, we don't call it a content optimization system, we call it a content management system. So it's really hard and uh, the name's gotta be perfect. It's gotta be a great story. You've gotta get a community of people behind it. it takes a village, it's risky. So I, I would just say it's not <laughs> the thing of art. If you're thinking of making that shift, be prepared to put most of your energy and most of your marketing energy not into marketing your product, but into marketing that idea in that category. Yeah, and, and it better be in a market that's big enough to warrant that kind of investment, right? Which it was for you. The interesting thing about our market, uh, Chris, was I remember pitching for a Series A and Series B and every, everyone was like, ah, oh, it's no market here. Marketing software, that's a crap market. No one's ever made money in marketing, so that, that'll never work. So it wasn't a real category at the time. I, I think we're founders and investors sometimes get stuck is they is the, if they're looking at a category and they're looking at deals in that category almost by definition they're looking at a new entrant building a better mousetrap the biggest companies are either the first in a category and nail that category or they see that category and see that wow it's fundamentally broken like google did this we need to build a better mousetrap but it's not going to be 10 percent better it's going to be a hundred times better so I get nervous about the fourth or fifth entrant into a category that doesn't have a really great angle on it. And I think investors and founders kind of get locked into that. Yeah. So that brings up an interesting segue. So how do you keep the company after 14 years and, and sort of creating this new category, which you are now dominating, how do you keep nimble? How do you, how do you keep focused on continuing to innovate and continuing to bring things to market that are unique and driving growth. Like, how do you think about that as the leader of the company or as a leader in the company? I don't really see us dominating anything at this point. We've really shifted from a inbound marketing company to we're just a very modern CRM. So ironically, we've shifted from creating a category to we're building a much better mousetrap than the incumbents in our industry. Slightly different view on how to do that. Philosophy and our methodology is really important, but I just think we have a bit, much better product than our competition. So we've shifted a bit. And when we made that shift, we sort of set out a vision of you know what we wanted the product to be over time, that we need to move from an app to a suite and then from a suite to a platform. And I would say we're 50% of the way through on our suite vision and 20% of the way through our platform vision. So there's just so much work left to do. Uh, so much work left to do and then so much competition so many people trying to take us down and so many new entrants and so many big companies and always acquisitions happening around us that there's just no time to relax really it's a never-ending quest so we don't have trouble coming up with new ideas like we have ideas for the next several years I look at the roadmap like boy there's so much work left to do you know we want to help our customers grow better like we have to execute really well on a series of initiatives over the next few years. And if we execute well, I think our customers will absolutely love it. So it's just the sense in my head of like, it's such an incomplete painting that we stay very nimble on it. Um, we also kind of come up with some standard things that work like inside of HubSpot. We, one of the things that's cool about HubSpot, I think in very different, we're building a CRM in a very different way. Like, there's a guy in the United States named Peter Thiel, very controversial guy. He's one of my least favorite people, but he's very smart. And he wrote a book uh, about startups and he started PayPal and he start, started Palantir. And his thing is when you start a company, you have to be right about something that everyone else thinks you're wrong about. And then it takes a long time to play out, but it turned out you were right. Okay. And that was us. Everybody thought building a marketing app was a bad idea. In the early years of HubSpot, we were kind of for small businesses. Everyone thought that was a bad idea. We turned out to be right about some of that stuff. And some people bet on us and we appreciate that bet. And it all played out nicely. There's a couple of things we think we're right about now that everyone thinks we're wrong about. One 
is the way you build a modern software company, particularly a CRM company. The tried and true playbook for building a CRM company was really started by Oracle. You buy Siebel, you buy like 15 different software applications and you glue them together and call it CRM. And you can grow very quickly doing that, but it's a bitch to buy, it's a bitch to set up, it's a bitch to install, it's a bitch to own. It's really hard. It's like, it's like very advanced calculus to do anything with that system. But they proved, like economically, that proved to work. And so Salesforce did it, um, Adobe's doing it, Zendesk is in the process of doing something similar. It, will, it probably works. Our attitude has been, yes, that might work. And everyone thinks we should do that. Our board thinks we should do that. Investment bankers think we do that. Everybody thinks we should just start buying companies. This is the, that's the playbook. We, we're going the exact opposite way. And we don't know if we're right yet, but hopefully we're right. We have this attitude of where we build products is we call it our primary color. So underneath HubSpot, there's automation, reporting, data, messaging. There's six or seven of these primary colors. Now, on top of those primary colors, we build our hubs. So we have a marketing hub, a sales hub, a service hub, a website hub. We have all these hubs on top of it. Really what those are is they're taking those primary colors and they're painting a hub essentially. And they're painting it with the same brush. They all rhyme with each other. There's one database, one view of the customer behind the scenes. There's no syncing batch processing. It's like an Apple product on the front end with you know, APIs and scale and security on the back end. If I look at Zoom and I look at Slack and I look at a lot of the new entrants that are growing very quickly, they kind of do it the same way where it's homegrown, it's, it's not cobbled together, it's, it's crafted, handcrafted in-house. It's built with a gorgeous consumer-like front end, but scalable back end that's enterprise uh, ready. So that's one thing we hope we're right about and that everybody else is wrong about, we'll see over the long haul. And so we, when we do acquisitions, we do these little tiny tuck-ins and we, we basically just rebuild it on our stack. The other thing we think we're right about and everyone else is wrong about is people describe the software industry is there's small business software and there's that ye old enterprise software. In small business software, well, there's a lot of them like in our world, like there's MailChimp, there's Wix, there's Squarespace, Shopify's kind of down there, like building for mom and pops. And then, holy crap, there's so many enterprise software companies from Oracle to Microsoft. You name these Salesforce, they're all up there. We kind of think there's a new category of software that's like from startup to scale up, from that five employee to 5,000 or that in-between company. And no one really builds for them. The small business software, yeah, it just doesn't work well for them, doesn't scale, doesn't have the functionality. The enterprise software is too hard. You build them through acquisitions. It's expensive. It's hard to set up. It's painful. So we're kind of, we're trying to create that category in the middle. And not a lot of companies have done that. NetSuite sort of did that on the back office, but they sold out and that, that is what it is. We want to build kind of that platform for, you know, companies that want to scale. It's not for mom and pop. It's not for my sister has a gardening shop in her hometown and she and her friends do it. They never are going to open another gardening shop. They don't care. Um, it's for a startup that wants to scale. Uh, so those are the two bets we're making that most people, including people on our board, uh, a lot of our investors over the years think are wrong. And I hope we're right. I mean, you'd love the whole, you know, app to suite to platform and then having a roadmap. Where does M&A fit in? You've done what, 11 acquisitions. You also have an investment arm. You put money in some early stage firms. We're not going to do many. Uh, just for the reasons I said, we're, so we had investment bankers come to our management offsite a couple of weeks ago. We had two of them, one from Morgan Stanley, one from this other firm. And, uh, and they all kind of come in. They're like, look at all these companies we have. Why don't you buy one of our companies? Because they make money every time they sell a company. Uh, and they're very convincing and compelling. Why don't you merge with this company or acquire this company? And then we did some research on, has there been any software tech company ever build a $100 billion dollar market cap company without effectively turning themselves into an M&A shop with a bunch of salespeople. There are vanishingly few. 
There's a little company in the United States called Apple that's done it. They do a lot of acquisitions, but they're small. They're between a million and 50 million, and they do one every two weeks. You'd be surprised how often they do them. But they're buying the team and some core technology, and then they blend it into their primary colors, and it shows. Mostly Amazon has done this. I mean, mostly they've done it. There have been some acquisitions, but for the most part, that is homegrown. There's another company in the U.S. called ServiceNow, not as famous, but it's about a $100 billion market cap and they have a very similar attitude where they largely built it in-house. They've been more patient about it and they've, they've grown north of 30% for a long, long period of time. And so we're going to do M&A. We're unlikely to buy hubs because we think our core competitive advantage is this gorgeous user interface, a single view of the customer, easy to set up, easy to buy, easy to own, easy to love, easy to use. And once you start cobbling things together, all, that sort of unique value prop goes away. And Brian, where where does uh, Asia fit for you? I know you set up an operation in Singapore, and and you know you got China, you got India, now Southeast Asia, which is emerging as the sort of next powerhouse. How are you looking at this part of the world? Yeah, excited about it. I spent a lot of time over there, so I'm very yeah. super excited about it. Uh, uh, we've got an operation in Japan. We got an operation in Singapore. Operation down in Australia. And it's super, super early. Like we just kind of opened them recently. It's early teams. Business is good. It's growing nicely. I think there's a very bright future for us in Asia. Uh, I would say it's the first inning though. Super, super early. And, you know, we mentioned earlier, Brian, how are you seeing competitive, not necessarily competitive, but just software companies coming out of this part of the world, right? You and I talked about Freshworks. You mentioned Zoho recently. There's a lot of our portfolio companies are there. You know, you and I have, talked about Deskera before and recently, you know, Intuit bought one of our business, which had gone to the U.S. and set up and built a reasonably successful business there. You know, when you are looking at from that part of the world, is that something you're starting to see emerging? I'll give you my two cents on this. Uh, You know, the internet has largely been an American thing. The big companies have come out of the United States and they've been global platforms. And like the first 30 years have been very U.S., I think the next 30 years are very different. And I don't think Fresh Desk for your Zoho are the, the canaries in the coal mine. I think it's TikTok is the canary in the coal mine. They built a really great app and it's taken off like crazy in the United States and Europe and all over the world. I don't see any reason why India, China, Southeast Asia aren't building awesome companies. Like there's, there's no, no reason that just happens in the United States. Like venture capital is over there. American venture capital is over there. Local venture capital is like yourself. There's money. Uh, there's talent. It's it's going to happen. I think the internet is a weird thing where, you know, there's there was only there was kind of one internet. The United States internet. And then China created its new internet. I I think there's going to be more of a balkanization on the internet as well. Like you're seeing what's happening in Europe. And it started with GDPR, but lots of privacy regulations coming out. That's evolving. That's spreading to the United States. It's going to have its own version of that. China's got their own version. I'm sure Southeast Asia is going to be grappling with similar questions. So like for a company like HubSpot, uh, we're going to need to have HubSpot in the United States. And we're going to have have HubSpot in Europe. And we're going to have to have HubSpot in Australia. We're going to have to have multiple HubSpots and deal with different uh, local legislation around privacy and whatnot. Um, I also think the uh, changes, I think there's going to be changes in terms of uh, the United States and Europe will probably break some of these big companies up. And so I think the the internet and software industry is about to change quite a bit over the next 10 years. And I I hearken it back to like the car industry. The car industry has been around a long time. It was an unregulated industry for a long, long time. Things like, let's say a seatbelt, which we all take for granted now. This uh, seatbelt was invented in like the 1940s, but it wasn't regulated. The car has to have a seatbelt in it until like the 1960s. So regulation trails. And I think regulation is going to be a big part of the industry uh, for a long, long time. The good news about that is change usually equals opportunity. It might, and, and people think, oh, all this regulation is going to slow down the Googles and Amazons, whatever. The weird thing that happens with regulation in these changes is it actually makes it harder on startups like you folks on the on the phone because yeah now you need a different version of your darn software for the United States and Europe and everywhere else like you get all this privacy stuff you have to deal with all this compliance stuff you have to hire lawyers and it's overhead so 
ironically, a lot of the legislation that's going to come out designed to really put pressure on the behemoths, I actually think hurts folks, folks like you guys on the phone. I think a new reality starting software industry is about to become a regulated industry like financial services, like so many other industries. It's already getting pretty heavily regulated in Europe. I think it's happen going to happen all over the world. And I think the internet's getting a little bit fractured and that might prove to be a big opportunity for folks in Asia. I think 10 years from now, there'll be as many, many big software companies coming out of international as the US. I don't see any reason why India can't be a powerhouse in the tech industry, in the software industry. I just don't see them. There's plenty of talent. There's money. People need to be patient. And same thing with Southeast Asia. I mean, there's, people, there's a, lot, a lot of smart people over there. I, I think it shifts. So I know we're running up uh, against the end of the hour, but I want to make sure we get some questions from the audience. One of the questions that we had that came in over chat was, um, you know, you mentioned that you tried a bunch of things that, that didn't work and you recognize that one specific thing you talked about was the second category creation effort around inbound sales didn't succeed. You know, why do you think that is? And I, I was struck by the clear eyed view you took of being able to admit when you try something and it doesn't work, right? Not everybody has that capability. That to me seems like it's part of the culture. So maybe just talk about, you know, what, what was it about that that clearly didn't work and how did you recognize it? I thought for sure it was going to work. I put together a deck and wrote an article about it and I sold it hard internally and I got pushed back from my market. My marketing team pushes back on everything I say anyway, but they pushed back hard on it. And my co-founder was like, I'm not sure about this. And I was like, no, it's going to work. Guys, come on, this is going to work. And so I got them vaguely behind me on it. Uh, I talked about it on stage or inbound conference and it just, people weren't parroting it back. Our sales reps weren't using the term. People on Twitter weren't talking about it. People weren't linking to my article. It just wasn't metastasizing into a bigger idea. And I was like, it's because we haven't pushed hard enough. Come on, we got to push harder. We got to talk about it more. We have more compelling content. And they had to like have an intervention with me. Like, hey, Hallie, this is just not working, dude. We are pushing a rock up a hill here. Uh, so I finally gave up on it. <laughs> and Brian, you know, I mean, as I mean, you're founder and then a CEO and building a whole suite of application heading towards a platform, which means you build several companies under that umbrella, have a bunch of CEOs. I mean, a lot of our founders here are uh, founders which are CEOs, but are sort of learning to become the real CEO. I mean, your own journey of how did you start really thinking like a CEO from a founder and obviously from your lessons that you've learned from other founders to see what can help us, you know, learn to, to be a better CEO or a good CEO. I would just say, I don't feel like I've got it figured out. I have, this is a term people use called imposter syndrome. I have it. And if you've got it, 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 and it's like, you don't feel like, you know what you're doing or you don't feel like you're good enough or you don't feel like you're doing it as well as so-and-so. I feel the exact same way even today on this call, getting on this call, saying in my head as I was walking down here drinking my coffee, like, I don't know anything more than the, I work with these guys. They're just as smart as I am. Like I got in the right place at the right time. I was a little lucky. I met the right co-founder, just like lightning in a bottle struck. I had that exact thought coming down here like I got nothing on Chris Racing. he's better than I am what the hell am I even getting interviewed by Chris Racing? that's exactly what I thought so get comfortable with that get comfortable with that if you don't have a little bit of that imposter syndrome there's probably something wrong with you <laughs> there's probably something wrong with you because it's a very unnatural act to, to, to have all these people follow you I was chatting with my head of product the other the day and he and he was like, hey, can you can you tell this guy Lou who's terrific and runs one of our product lines like, hey, can you can you build him up? He's a little bit worried how you think about him. And I was just thinking that and I slack back and I'm like, I just can't believe anyone gives a shit about what I think about them. I just am so shocked. And he's like, people really care what you think. They really look up to you. I was like, it's still shocking to me. Um, and so I don't by any means have a figure out. Having said that, I try to get better. Uh, and I think being a CEO is a bit of a craft. And 
I read a ton and I don't read a lot of business books. I read anytime someone comes out with an autobiography that's been a CEO. I love those. A biography I like too, but an autobiography like Bob Iger's autobiography was great. Like not good, great, the Disney CEO. I'm reading Reed Hastings, the Netflix CEO's autobiography. Like I will devour those. I build a board of folks who I think can help me, who can, who, who match kind of my weak spots. That's helpful. And I'm in a CEO group. So once a week, there's about 15 of us CEOs of public SaaS companies to get together and we just talk about our problems and share best practices. And it's a terrific group. CEO of Shopify, of Zoom, of Slack, of Zendesk, of you know, a bunch of these big tech companies. Not quite the Amazon and Apple, but like that next level down. Misery does love company. Like a lot of the things I'm worried about and stressed about, they're dealing with a lot of the changes around Black Lives Matter, a lot of the changes around COVID, um, a lot of the regulation stuff. They're complicated and it's very, very nice to have a group of CEOs. So if you're not in one of those CEO groups, you guys should form one. Do it without your investors. You don't want the investors listening on that. But you should get together and even if you don't learn anything, a little bit of misery loves company is helpful. And try in that group to, you need to create a culture in that group where people can really talk freely about the problems they're having. Everyone's trying to sell each other something. Like you can't be selling each other your products all the time. That can't be the, the vibe in your CEO group. CEO groups are an important part of my development though.